This is Suzanne van Doorn of Mind Vanda, a blog about spirituality, mythology and psychology. If you look at the screen, you can notice a sign up button. Please sign up because there are lots of good interviews coming up. And today we are going to talk with a man that has been doing some really good work in the field of dreams. He is professor of psychology and sociology of the University of California and he wrote a number of books along which Who Rules America? Finding Meaning in Dreams and the, the Scientific Study of Dreams is still considered classic in the field. Today my guest is William Domhoff. Hello Bill. How Hi. are you? I'm so glad to be here. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that you agreed to do this interview because MindFunda has got online uh, dream courses and one of them is uh, the course Dreaming About Brain and one of the lessons features the three most important lines of research in dream research nowadays, psychodynamic uh, line, the neurocognitive line where uh, Mr. Domhoff is the representative of and the activation input um, modulation model of uh, Hobson. So today we are going to ask Bill Donoff uh, all kinds of questions in a little interview about dreaming. Okay. Hi. Uh, could you tell us the story about how you became professionally engaged in dreaming? Yes. Uh, it was in 1959, 1960. I finished my master's degree in psychology and I was beginning my PhD work at the University of Miami. And two things I was interested in, human motivation, personality, and so on. And two things happened. Uh, one was a coincidence, uh, one was uh, scientific advance. It so happened that at the University of Miami uh, that year there was a visitor named Calvin S. Hall. And at that time he was a very famous personality a psychologist and he was a dream researcher and so I took his course but more than that uh, at that very time was when the excitement really began about the new laboratory dream research even though REM rapid eye movements were discovered in 1953 it was really not until 1957-58 that people knew about the non-REM REM cycle through the work of William DeMent and uh, Nathaniel Kleitman so there I was just a year or two after those papers appeared and I caught the excitement both of Calvin Hall and of others and uh, things began appearing in newspapers and on the uh, front of magazines, famous magazines of the time, like Time Magazine and Newsweek and, and I got involved in the dream research really right at the start. And there were just two or three psychologists involved at the time beside um, Calvin and there I was and I was always on the content analysis side as far as my own research but I would go to the meetings of the Association for the Psychophysiological Study of Sleep as we were called then and William DeMent really was able to bring together physiologists and psychologists and physicians psychiatrists interested in dreams and it was a very exciting time so thus I became a dream researcher and it hadn't been my original plan um, but I was looking for something to study that would uh, help us understand about the human mind and the famous metaphor that day was that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious yes yeah. yeah. and many other things and of course now that we knew we dreamed five or six times a night and we thought that our eye movements were tracking those dreams the REM deprivation had just come out. It looked, go ahead. You, you were talking about um, how you got into the dream research by accident, but you were fascinated with it. And maybe uh, you could um, give a, a concluding remark. Um, um, maybe I could say something about that. I know that. Um, um, Oh, Kelvin Hall and, and Van der Castel. Van der Castel, I like that story so much. He read about uh, Stanley Kripner's uh, laboratory and he came biking by because he wanted to be a participant. Those were the days. They're, those were the magic days. That happened weren't it? a tiny bit 
after I left uh, Miami. So I never met Bob until years later. Um, but uh, he, he did get into dream research the same way. Calvin Hall had gotten a big grant from the uh, government to study dreams. And he hired Van de Castle. Uh, and Van de Castle um, had an interest in dreams and more, you know, in parapsychology too. And they, they were just a handful of dream researchers. And, and, and they did involve Montague Allman and yeah. Stan Schrittner yeah. pretty quickly. And so Bob got a connection with them as well as with Calvin. And uh, so, yeah, they were very formative kinds of, of days. Everything was new and fresh. Um, and uh, so we had a lot of excitement and drew in a lot of new researchers, including me. Yeah, yeah. The neurocognitive model is in my eyes so charming because it brings, brings dreaming the nighttime into the daytime, a very mythological um, perspective, of course. It's, it's science, but uh, captured in a mythological shelf. Um, could you tell us how daydreaming is related to dreaming? Yes. What happened was that in the 1990s, to our total surprise, there were just certain areas of the brain became, that became activated again during REM sleep. And that, of course, was really interesting to us because we always assumed the whole brain had gone back into action during REM. And uh, that, plus the developmental findings by Fawkes on children in the 1980s and the work on uh, neurological lesions by Mark Solms, which came out in 1997, those combined. And for me, I immediately saw that we could have a neurocognitive theory of dreams, and I gave a paper on that in 2000 and published a paper in 2001. And then things kind of sat there for a few years, uh, but at the same time, there were a set of researchers totally independently, not working on dreams, who accidentally discovered what our brain patterns look like when we're kind of daydreaming and mind wandering. And they called it the default network, and they began to publish on that topic. And the interesting thing was that several of us that were dream researchers, along about the same time, we said, you know what? That's the same network that's really active in REM. Now, we knew that because we were dream researchers. They didn't know that because they weren't interested in dreams. So that was the birth of then this modern and I think much more exciting uh, version of a neurocognitive theory of dreaming because it really says to me and, and uh um, what I now emphasize is, I think dreaming is an intensified form of not mind wandering and, and daydreaming. And so, uh, literally, it's just probably a few more changes in the pattern between our attentional networks and the network that keeps track of the world and our, our uh, network for spontaneous thought. Just a few changes in their relationship, and we slip from daydreaming, wow, right into dreaming. Um, and we know that, I think, because accidentally in the 1970s, David Fawkes, when he was training participants to be sharper at night, had had them in the lab with the EEG on them during the day. And he said, I'm, I want you to learn to focus on the last thing you were thinking of when I call you. So I want you to go in this relaxed room, and slightly lighted, and every once in a while I'm going to say, what's going through your mind? So he was just practicing Lo and behold, every once in a while he said, wow, he's having a little dream. So he was surprised. But we didn't know what to do with that information. And indeed, he then was so surprised himself, he replicated it and turned out the same, and he replicated again. But that information just sat there until uh, this work on the default network, which we kind of became aware of, became more visible in science between 2005 and 2010, and then I put that together in my own mind with uh, Fawkes' earlier work on uh, little snippets of dreaming during mind wandering. And so that's why I believe that during mind wandering, we can actually slip over pretty quickly to dreaming. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we also see that when we fall asleep at night because we're not really in sleep, but we're in what's called sleep onset. Which, and at a certain point, we have little dreams. And that had been studied very carefully uh, by three or four different researchers. So you put together that there's um, 
little snippets of dreaming during mind wandering you put to together with that with sleep onset you put that together with uh, the default network looks like the REM network and you say dreaming is an intensified form of mind wandering that has the same neural basis and it does then put as Ernest Hartman emphasized when he wrote about this that it puts daydreaming and dreaming on a continuum and uh, and lots more because you know when we have our best insights we're probably doing some mild fairly easy task we're driving down a freeway or you know we're standing in a shower but after all we're still having to keep alert but our mind can drift and, and that's when people say oh, I just had a great idea they're doing some mildly a challenging task but their mind is able to also drift so we're kind of in and out of those uh, being real alert and being real uh, spontaneous and bang we have insights and so I think that insights daydreaming uh, mind wandering and, and dreaming then become much closer than any but a few researchers had ever thought and there were a couple particular John Antrobus, who was a great contributor to dream research from the 60s on, he and his mentors had always thought there was a close relationship between uh, uh, dreaming and daydreaming. And so um, he's having quite a, a renaissance and all his work was cited by all of these new mind-wandering researchers. They've reached back to John Antrobus, which is really a lot of fun. and and he's writing things for them and so on. So it's brought dreams and daydreaming uh, closer than they've ever been with a brain basis, but also with a very much a basis in terms of the nature of the content. Because, you know, our daydreams are about our worries and concerns and our thoughts about the future, and that's what our dreams are portraying. Our dreams are simply more, have more mental imagery, and so that means we hear, we see, uh, we feel, uh, and so we call dreaming embodied simulation. That we, we don't just think it, we experience it. Our body is uh, more active, and parts of the brain that are connected with the emotions that we're having in that dream or the movements we're making in that dream, those parts of the brain, those imagery areas for sensory motor, for instance, they're active. When you're running, you're, you're primary sensory motor cortex is not active but the images for running and hearing and seeing and smelling they are active and we don't notice that most of us because we're sighted but if we then turn to to, uh, to uh, blind people their dreams are full of taste and touch and smell vivid as ours but is it the same principle that sports mentors use to improve the um, abilities of their sporters, uh, the visualization of movement right. to um, yeah, make them... Yeah, trying to use imagery. And mm -hmm. so, but I think we're having our strongest imagery during dreams. I mean, dreams mm -hmm. are, that's why they're so real. And that's one of the other important things I think about dreams in a more general sense of, of theory of a mind is that when the conditions are right, meaning we're not paying much attention and we're screening out incoming stimuli and uh, our brain's very active, we have enormously powerful imagery. And so we wake up and we say that was real, or at least it felt real. And, uh, and that's, that is what I say. That really does, that's the most exciting stuff right now. And what, what is the, the most uh, exciting research that you have uh, been participated in or read about? Recent yeah. research. Well, it definitely most exciting in the last few years has been, I think, this neurocognitive research because there now are so many people studying uh, using neuroimaging to study so many things. And for us as dream researchers, we read, I read through those articles. They never mention dreams, but I get a lot out of them for what I'm doing. And so I think that I know how we actually, in terms of brain uh, uh, systems, I think I do know how we make the transition to dreams, or at least I have a hypothesis because we know that when the central executive network, which is watching the world and keeping track of things, when that either gets bored 
or it's dealing with repetitive stimuli, it's or it's getting messages from our sleep system, then it uh, deactivates a little. And when it does, then our default network goes up. And when our default network goes up, our attentional network starts to go down. And when the attentional network goes down and the central executive network is down, the, the core of the mind, the mind wandering, thinking internally kind of thing is active. It's running wild. It's on its own. And it can bring in memory systems and imagery systems and pull on emotional systems and create its own little reality. Uh, but as I say, I think the key thing for us as dream researchers is that it does feel real. And so when uh, today, lots of psychologists are interested in what they call embodied simulation. The greatest example of an embodied simulation is without question in my mind, a dream. And I think that then um, it, it gets their attention because they say, wow, because normally they leave dreams off to the side. Um, but now that they have a brain basis and now they see the continuum, um, I think they're going to pay a lot more attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, I know that uh, Robert Bosnak has been working with embodiment um, as a way of, of explaining of interpreting dreams to experience a dream and to see where in the body you feel a reaction. What's your yeah. opinion about that? Well, I don't know much about that, so I shouldn't mm -hmm. express an opinion, but oh, I do sorry. think it's perfectly plausible mm -hmm. uh, that, I mean, because, you know, the more we learn about embodiment and and its effects on people, then the more you know, and say say they're doing that in various kinds of waking research, then the more that carries over to use in dream groups and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, being a book addict, um, apart from your two excellent books, what what recent book would you would you recommend for all of us? Well, I would recommend a book by Joseph Ledeau, who's a psychologist at NYU, and he just wrote a book called Anxious came out in 2015. And Ledeau started his career studying um, what he called originally a fear vigilance system, the, the system that's built around yeah. when, you, yeah. when you suffer a frightening Amygdala. Yeah. Amygdala. Amygdala is one key hub oh. in it. Oh. He now talks about the threat system and the defensive response system. And then he says the conscious experience of that is fear. And But, but the point is that he uses that that particular emotion is a prototype of how things work and then he develops himself a theory of consciousness and the thing is that I think God dreams just fit in there really well so wading through his book which is very well written it's a fun read I think um, um, has a lot of interesting things that we can extract from it uh, for dreams. Incidentally, I, I guess I've kind of said this, but when I read a book or when I go to a, a talk, I'm always reading in terms of what could this possibly tell me about dream? I don't care about anxious so much. I don't care about those waking things. I say, what's the angle for a dream researcher? Mm -hmm. And if there's an angle, then I assimilate it. If there's not, I you know only got so much brain storage space, so I put it aside and just focus on the things that are relevant to dreams. Well, thank you. What final question for you? What's the best advice you can give to the people watching who are interested in dreaming? Well, I guess the first thing I would I would try to say, and it's a kind of a pitch, is that I think I would start writing down my dreams just to have them. And I wouldn't start studying them. I wouldn't lay a theory on them. But I just would have my own uh, experiential base, that is, of, of dreams, and what it is to remember them, to report them, to write them down, because I think, and that leads into what I, is the most, I think, the important research. We've talked a lot about neurocognitive and imaging, and we could have talked about brain lesions and their effects on dreams, but most of us aren't going to have an opportunity to do that kind of research. There is research that we can all do that I think is really rigorous and good. And it involves the detailed study of dream journals that people have already written for their own reasons. Those are called unobtrusive archival measure, me, measures in psychology. They are very legitimate. 
and they can be studied in a very systematic way. We've done a lot of statistical studies of them to show that they are very good data. And so if we collect those kind of dreams, I think we can learn in more detail about dreaming life. We're only going to understand about symbolism or unusual features in dreams in terms of other dreams in that same person's dream journal. Uh, there's all this methodological reason why yeah, just getting a sample, a random sample of people, you can't get a big enough sample size. You can't quiz them and so on. So we need dream journals from people who are willing to answer questions. On the other extreme, I think if I were a young dream researcher, I would look at the method that Ernest Hartman first put forth and that I worked very hard to develop called the most recent dream method. You go into any group, uh, including a classroom, and you say, may I have 25 minutes of your time, just to have, so that you don't feel pressed, and say, would you write down your most recent dream? And you keep saying, a dream like you had this morning or yesterday. Uh, so think about it write it down, tell us exactly when you had it, and that's all called priming for recency so they don't write their first dream or their nightmare or their favorite dream. We want their most recent dream. And I am convinced from the research we've done, we've done five or six studies, if I have 125 most recent dreams from nine-year-olds all over this world, I will have a representative sample of nine-year-olds' dream life. If I have 125 dreams from skydivers and 125 dreams from scuba divers, I will have a representative sample of their dream life in 25 minutes. It's a good sample. And otherwise, we're in all kinds of trouble in collecting dreams. You say, would you write your dreams down for two weeks? First, they wonder why we're doing it. Secondly, they don't do it. And pretty soon you say, did you write some dreams down? Did you write some dreams down? Well, now we're leading the witness. Now we're in a situation where we have, in a way, data that's contaminated by the fact that we're asking these people for this stuff, and they're kind of wondering, why are we doing this? Or all do it to please him. And sometimes they make up dreams, and, and they write them hastily. So a most recent dream, 25 minutes, 20 minutes with adults, and you have great, good data. And if, if every high school teacher a high school teacher in every country or a dream researcher in every country collected most recent dreams on the same day, for example, uh, I think you'd have a great big database and then they share them. And we now have, the other thing aside from all this neuroimaging, the thing we have that's really exciting is the capability with computers. That if we collected most recent dreams in 10 different countries, had them translated, you don't even actually have to translate them, and then you put them on Dream Bank in a private place, which is our site for searching dream. You can search those dreams. You can do very specific studies. I can study, I can find out how, what percentage of the time mothers or fathers, sisters or brothers or airplanes appear in 10,000 dreams. I can find that in a half a second. And I prints out a bar diagram showing you the consistency over time, it compares it with the norms. We could do an enormous amount if we had most recent dreams and if we had dream journals and we took advantage of all the new computer software technology, we could do enormously good studies that are in a way the counterpart to this neuroimaging study. We don't do enough of those. I know that two-week dream diaries have their uses, but lots of people don't finish. Uh, lots of people, you have to goose them again. And pretty soon, you know, in psychological terms, you have data that's iffy in terms of its quality. And uh, so that's why I make a pitch for uh, dream journals and most recent dreams. Um, and that plus neurocognitive is uh, by reading them. And I think with those that combination, we can continue to develop a better and better theory. Okay. Well, thank you for your time and for My your pleasure. clear answers. And oh. uh, uh, until uh, next time. <laughs>